welcome to That's Cool Speak. Today is Friday, March 29th. I'm Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. Thank you for coming over on this amazingly, sort of disturbingly beautiful day um, as we get ready for April. Oh my gosh. How are you? There, um, okay, so get a snack. There's chicken salad in the refrigerator. I'm not gonna lie, it's really good. Uh, I am heavy on a grape in a chicken salad, just forewarning you. It is like at least 20% grapes. I don't know why. It's just, it's just who I am. <laughs> I never had, we never had chicken salad when I was a kid. Ever. Like I did not have chicken salad until I was an adult. And now I love it. It's such a delicious option. Okay, so today we have, so we have things to talk about. Um, we're upstairs because light and things and times and things that you don't care about, but just FYI in case you do. Uh, this week's episode is going to have shameless self-promotion. It might have shenanigans. It will have knitting. It will have quilting. I'm just looking at the piles that currently surround me. And it might have some reading. Um, it doesn't... Oh, it has, it has some stitching. This is how insane it is. I brought everything upstairs and I tried to do it all in one trip because I'm insane. Um, it did not work. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, but let's get into it. So let's just go right into shameless self-promotion. April 1st, fatsquirrelfibers.com. Um, I'm going to have a spring cleaning sale. So this is where I'm going to use up sort of like, like these are going to be mostly lower quantities. There are a few that are greater quantities. Um, but these are kind of just like leftover bits and bobs from either pre-orders where I had extras, um, or it might be like things that I miscut originally, like where I offered things in a large wedge, but I miscut them. And so now they'll be like in a small wedge, like at the time I just couldn't deal. <laughs> Uh, it's really sad when you miscut the, the, the spoon flower fabrics. It, it does cause a lot of like, <laughs> um, so yeah, let's just like, get right into it and let's discuss what's happening. Um, so these are ones you've all seen before, but we have mushroom butts, we have carrot butts, and we have butterflies. These all have unbleached cotton linings. We have bless your heart. There are good quantities of bless your heart, okay? And butterfly, and uh, mushroom butts. And we have a few of the most recent pre-order where I did the cuppas that went with the frogs and the quilties. Right. Okay, so those are all sock sizes. And then in like these small wedge, which is one I have not done forever, but, okay, so I'll explain it with this one. I didn't bring my project bag. I was using a project bag that I made probably eight years ago and it's out of these um, beautiful ruby star linen cotton canvases. They're a lighter weight cotton canvas so they don't have as much body as like the spoon flower denim that I usually use and so I have kind of like gone back and forth of like Natural. Normally, I would interface them, but when you interface them, you use you lose like a lot of like the beauty of the fabric, um, of this specific kind of fabric. So I decided I'm gonna do some of these um, in a small wedge, and so I have a good quantity of these, which are these like fun, like very printmakerly. We've got like good ochre and fun aqua. Right, and this is a perfect size for like a two skein project. Um, it's just, basically they're the same depth as my large ones, they're just slightly narrower. They're a couple inches like narrower this way. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I don't see, we'll see if you like them, but I just love this fabric and I have some more of these canvases that I have sort of been hoarding, but then also sitting on because I've been hesitant to use them in a way that I normally would. Um, for larger bags, I do feel like they need a little bit more body. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But I love them so much. They have such a good hand. And like also just like this nice sort of like n sort of nubbly, sort of rustic texture that's just so pretty. Um, 
So yeah, so there are these. And then these are the, oh, that's the only of this kind of fabric that I have in this one. But then I also have, oh, and there's gonna be some that I don't show you because I just have like one or two of them. Right, so I had some cats and house coats. So this is a pre-order I did a while back, but I had this strip that I had cut too narrow. Um, and this is a linen cotton canvas. And isn't it just the cutest? So there'll be some of those. And then in my more traditional large wedge size, I have some library bags. Okay. So there'll be libraries in some large wedge and there'll also be a sweater size, a couple sweater sizes. Um, I have this super fun bunny ice cream cart. I have these amazing, and I have both of these also in my Aran size. They're just a few of the bigger Aran size, but these also. I oh, how great is this print? Originally when I bought this print, there was a miss, um, a miss in the file. It's not, it was not in the printing process. It was actually in the designer's file. And so one of these birds has like this like derpy black line mouth. So, so I had to like waste a lot of the fabric, unfortunately. Um, but I was able to rescue enough for a couple of bags. So there's gonna be those. Um, there is this like super fun sort of like nordic -y tea time jam. Right, isn't that just like the best color combo? Oh, and then there's these, I love this. I don't know why I've not done more of these. How stinking cute he is on his scooter. Like it's such good color and a fun print. Like, isn't that great? I really should get more of that. I'm like, look at how cute this stinking little bug is. And the snail. I should get more of that because that is just so cute. And then I have this guy with your like class, like your old school classics, like Thumbelina, the Snow Queen. Uh, but it's also just like visually, I really like this print. Like it's a good color combination, fun bookshelfy vibe. So there'll be all of those. There'll be more. Um, there'll be a mo few more of the large wedge, and then there will be some sweaters and some Aran sweaters that uh, we'll just have a few of them. So again, that'll be April first, nine p.m. Eastern time. That's squirrelfibers.com. Hopefully, I did not just throw those on Gus. He wouldn't mind, really, quite frankly. Oh my gosh, go get some chicken salad for me because I'm kind of hungry all of a sudden. What's going on? Okay, so that's that. Oh my gosh, shenanigans, y'all. I've had no shenanigans because you know what? Last time we talked, I told you about this like random fever I had that like knocked me out. Guess what? I had another one. You're going to, you're going to say that you're going to think that I'm making this up, but you know me and like, why would I do that? Because it just makes me look like an idiot, quite frankly. Um, oh my gosh, I had a fever and I got the chills so bad. It was a nighttime again, I was in the bed and I could not, I could not function. Like, yes, clearly I should have gotten out of bed. I should have put like another blanket on the bed. I should have gone and got a hot water bottle. I should have gone and take some Advil or something to help with the fever. And I clearly also should have taken like a Delta eight gummy or something to help me relax because I was shivering so hard. But of course, you know, when you're like that, you just can't, you can't function, like you can't function. Like, right, like that's like me saying, like that's clearly what I should have done. Um, and like, that's what I would have done if it had been like my partner or something, but I was not, I was in the bed by myself. And I think I literally, okay, I know I did, but I say I think because it feels weird. I totally injured my back from shivering so hard. Like the next day I woke up, I just felt like hot garbage. Like I just was like, I need to rest all day. I felt really just like. Uh, 
Gus has seen a squirrel in the tree. He's displeased. I think that's what it is. I don't have my glasses on, so I have no idea. It could be a badger. It's possible. I may have injured my back from a fever. It could be a badger. I don't know what's going on anymore. What kind of like weird Alice in Wonderland am I living in? It's not wonderful. <laughs> oh my gosh, though. So like, okay, so the, the day after I had the fever, I just felt like trash. I just was like, I slept. I did not feel good. Um, and then the next day I woke up and I was like, uh, I sat down to have a cup of coffee. I stood up and could not. Like I just couldn't, like I could not stand up. And it's like that lower back, but like on the right, I think that's like QL, right? It's the same thing I did last year when I picked up an air conditioner and like put myself out of commission for like a month. Luckily, oh my gosh, really the train, the, the dog, everything is insane. Um, luckily it only laid me up for like four days. For like four days. Okay, for a solid two days, I was useless. Like luckily I had already packaged your things up, but I could not, like I had from the last orders, but I could not get to, I couldn't, I could not drive a car. I could not leave my house. I could not function at all. I could not stand up. I had to Google how to stand up with a bad lower back because I would literally be in a chair and be like, I like, I tried crawling. <laughs> that also did not work. Okay, if you ever have this trouble again, look it up because there are like actual techniques to getting up when you're hurt your back. Um, if you're ever a person who has been pregnant, it's sort of like when you stood up when you were pregnant. I don't know why that did occur to me at the time. Oh, that's right, because I was in intense pain and terrified that I would not be able to stand up. <laughs> and then my partner would come home to find me, like, perhaps in a puddle of my own urine. What? It was awful. <laughs> like, the second day, I had, like, a little bit of a hissy fit where I was just like, I can't function. I don't know what is wrong. How does this happen? I didn't even do anything actively to mess up my back. This is all of it. I'm too, I'm getting old. I'm over it. I'm done. I totally had a bit of a breakdown. I'm fine now. <laughs> Mostly. So tell me, have you ever thrown your back out from a fever? It's possible that like I was just so tired that I slept in a weird way. That's always also fun when you're like, I have a sleep related injury. When you like, you know, like that time you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, this is awful. I can't move my whole head. And it's literally just because you slept funny. It's possible. It's possible. I think it was the fever. <laughs> I've been like sitting around like planning garden stuff. Luckily I, oh, did I get that done? Yeah, I got the, I got my seeds done be right before I hurt my back. In fact, it was literally Sunday, the diet that I got the fever. Um, so my seedlings are started. I'm a little bit nervous about them. <sighs> They're not coming up as much as I would like them to. Maybe I didn't get them watered enough because I was unable to get out of a chair. We'll see. We'll see how they go. But I've been deep in like, what can I do to the garden? I've been really like, let's spend $12,000 on the garden so that we can grow like $17 worth of veg. That's where my brain has been. Like yesterday, I got so obsessed with potatoes. I got so obsessed. I've grown potatoes before and they are really fun to grow. Um, but I did not plan on growing them this year uh, because they do require, like I just have very limited space. And so like I had already planned what I was growing and knew that I was pretty much maxed out on space. But then I was suddenly like, I, ha I, ha I have to grow potatoes. Like, like the police are gonna come and get me if I don't grow but Like that's really not what I thought, but like that's the urgency I felt. 
in my, oh my gosh, why am I not growing? Why have I not planned to grow potatoes? Did I spend like way too long on Fedco's website looking at all the potatoes that I needed to grow? And then the fact that they had like a $75 shipping fee. Yes, I did. It wasn't $75, but it was like a good 80% of the potato price was the shipping price. And I was just like, Then I was like calculating like, okay, if I grow them in grow bags and then how many cubic yards of soil would I need? And then like, how would I store the cubic yards of soil? Because when you grow potatoes in grow bags, you only put a little bit of soil in at a time and then you're like constantly hilling them up. So like somehow I have to like also store this like cubic yard of soil that I'm gonna get in my like 600 square foot backyard. <laughs> I don't know if that's the number I'm making it up. In my urban backyard. <laughs> With like, no, like it's fenced and there's a garage behind it. Like there's no actual access for like a dump truck to bring the dirt. Like I was literally like, well maybe they could put it in the alley and then like we could just very quickly transport it all into the, like a whole whole day of like well what maybe should, should I get the coconut coir to help with the moisture retention if I do grow them in grow bags like how much mental energy I could have like solved a good problem in the world okay not really but like I probably could have done something productive <laughs> instead I had to engage in like a good four hours of mental gymnastics and then something happened and I was like what is wrong with me I think I was like adding it up and I was like okay this is literally gonna be it was like between the cute this the soil and the grow bags and potentially the coconut coir and this <laughs> and the Fedco seed tails okay I know I could get them from local store but like it was pretty exciting to look at the Fedco ones because they've got some real sexy varieties of potatoes. Um, but like all together it was gonna cost like a hundred dollars and I was like, and that was gonna maybe grow like may, like if I did a really good job, was gonna grow me like 60 pounds of potatoes. And I was just like, <laughs> now granted the dirt and the grow bags would be like a thing that could happen, like could continue on in my gardening life. Oh, what is wrong with me? <laughs> what is wrong with me? Anyway, <laughs> see potato show. Oh my goodness, I'm so hungry all of a sudden. Now I'm talking about potatoes and all I can think about is all the potato descriptions from Fedco. Y'all, are you interested in, in potatoes, seed, seed potatoes at all? You have to go look at fedcoseeds.com. They're not even like super fancy varieties. Like there are plenty of places that have like very exotic potato varieties, but this company I think is in Maine. It's very New Englandy. I want to say it's in Maine because I feel like I did look at the shop at the shipping prices if you picked up locally. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to go to Maine to pick these up or anywhere in New England, but I was just curious, you know, I was just curious. Um, like clearly it's like us in the Midwest, we just need to get in and next year we could get like a, a freight shipment. What is wrong with me? So many things. So, oh my goodness, my cart's still saved. Like, I'm not buying it. Uh, but, but these are the these are the varieties that I decided on. I'm not buying them. Um, I decided on ger German butter balls. They only had organic left, which are quite pricey. But let me just discuss: with flesh just dry enough for a fry or a hash, the butter ball has high yields, good storage qualities, and shows some virus and scab resistant, susceptible to rhizosite. <laughs> large prostrate vines with few white flowers. These plants produce delectable buttery balls that are hands down the best tasting roasting potato in the winter. Is it? 
Maybe it is and I've never even tasted it. Purple Viking. Oh my gosh, you guys, look at how fun this potato looks. Purple Viking. Pink. <laughs> What's your podcast about? I don't know. I just read potato descriptions. I didn't plan on doing this, y'all. But here, let's do it together. Pink splashed purple skin, white flesh. A crowd pleaser at market and fresh out of the oven. The Purple Viking has got show-stopping purple skin with vivid pink splashes that is sure to reel in an audience. I'm reeled in. It's creamy, rich flesh when baked, roasted, or mashed will keep ev keep the everyone happy. Okay, slight typo. Uh, for size, style, style. I want a potato with style. For size, style, yield, and taste, it's an all-around winner. Vikings grow on the large, knobby side. So if you want smaller, no, I don't. More uniform potatoes, no, thank you. Plant closer than 10 inches apart. Shows some resistance to leaf hoppers. I don't even know what leaf hoppers are, but I might have them. I might need these potatoes. We have no suitable substitutions for this unusual variety. Even if you accept substitutions, you will receive a refund instead of potatoes if this variety is out of stock. Those were the two that I was most excited about. But I also added in Katadin because it felt like it was maybe like like a good like count like a good like plainer potato i don't know how jazzy these red vikings are buff skin white flesh released in 1932 by the usda and maine also because it's from maine and Canada is like the end point of the appalachian trail they got me on all these levels it is the standard to which all storage potatoes are compared mount Katahdin, maine's tallest peak at 5267 feet is a famous for its vertigo inducing knife edge trail katadin means the greatest mountain and in pops in the penobscot language whether you're hungry from hiking or gardening set a kitchen knife's edge to katadin the potato and fill your belly with its warm comforting goodness <laughs> you were wondering where that knife's edge thing was going or didn't you were wondering i felt you wonder they brought you back whether you're I'm just gonna read it again it's too, let's let's do it all because I'm really prepared for the narrative journey we were taking Mount Katahdin Maine's tallest peak at 5,267 feet is famous for its vertigo inducing knife edge trail Katahdin means the greatest mountain in the Penobscot language whether you're hungry from hiking or gardening Set a kitchen knife's edge to cat it in the potato and fill your belly with its warm, comforting goodness. This might be the best podcast I've ever done. <laughs> Very well suited to a main growing season, spreading plants can produce some lunkers. The tubers lend toward the soil surface, so heal well. Resistant to mild mosaic, but not spindle tuber, leaf roll, or scab. Medium to large spreading plant with many large light purple flowers this is also a side note um they have this note on lots of them that say indigenous royalties we are paying royalties for varieties given indigenous names to a wabanaki project here in maine yes it is wabanaki For only $20, you can get 10 pounds of the cat and potatoes, and then that could potentially le like yield you 100 pounds of potatoes. That is so exciting. How am I going to live <laughs> knowing the potential of the cat and potato is outside of my reach? I don't know, but I'm going to have to. <laughs> Oh, the world. It is so full of terrible things, y'all. But somebody out there is writing the copy for the cat and potato, and it gives me hope. That's all I'm saying. I should just stop the podcast now. What, what am I even doing? The rest of this is nonsense. That's amazing. Okay. Let's talk about quilting.
<laughs> so last time I showed you um, my little like hand quilting project. So here she is, she's all pillowed up. Here's the back of it, which I just machine quilted. Um, I'm very pleased. I put just a zipper in the bottom. So there's just like a plain old pillow form in there. What did I do? Oh, I just zigzagged the edges so that I could wash it, hopefully without it fraying out too badly. Um, but yeah, she can go this way. She can go this way. Yay. Okay, and now it's like very poor choice for color. <laughs> but I did it and it's a thing. So then I just started on, I think I showed you, right? My little like carpet bag project. So I pieced this one originally to take with me to my class, but then I chickened out because I was afraid it was too busy and it might be a bad idea, which I think I made a good decision. Um, but here's my girl so far. So now I'm deciding if I want to do, originally I thought I would do like a different quilt design on each like kind of like section. And so I'm still, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm fairly sure that's what I'm going to do. Because the other option of course would be to continue this on, which I love this quilting design. Uh, it's very traditional, right? And it's like the right amount of quilting, right? It's like enough that you feel like you did something, but it's not too dense. Um, so this is this side, right? I kind of hesitated. I thought maybe I should just stop the quilting for the like beautiful Addie's Best Patch, but I don't know. We're just, I'm going to experiment. I'm okay. It's okay if I do it. And I think maybe I should have done it a different way. It's okay. I have more patches because maybe I'm addicted to them. <laughs> so there's that. And then, okay. So then you haven't seen this. I'm going to put a picture in. Okay, no, I'll show you close and then I'll show you the picture. So I bought this crazy, like very not my typical um, color scheme back quarter bundle from Penelope's, Penelope Handmade Studio. So I'll put a picture in here. But So it's just three by six flying geese. Oh, sorry, there's like leaves on it. I took the picture on our uh, blackberry vines, which I didn't even notice, but they're totally like getting all spruced up. They're leafy and stuff. I'm very afraid. I'm afraid we're gonna have a bad frost. Um, but I was like, I, I had like a couple of peat blocks left over and I was like, oh, I should bring those up so I can show those. Like, what I do that whole quilt. Basically we have to like pull the whole quilt around. Um, this is just gonna be like a quilt for my tabletop. So basically just a tablecloth. Um, I say tabletop because I don't like a lot of extra like hangover or if I have hangover, I like it to just be in one direction. So I don't know how I'm gonna show you this. Like, why do I think? Okay, so if this is the table, <laughs> this is the tablecloth top. Like I don't, I want like hangover. Like, okay, this is the tablecloth. <laughs> I want like hangover in this direction, but not in this one, right? Cause like when I have hangover in both directions, it's like too bulky and it like slides around and it's like a whole thing. But if I can limit the hangover to either one direction or none, so either so it just hangs over in one or if it just sits perfectly on the top, that's my goal. Um, so this will have hangover in one, in the long direction, like I kind of showed you there. Um, so these are all three by six flying geese. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so finished three by six flying geese. And so basically what you do is you just take fat quarters and you just make them in the inverse of one another. And then you pair those next to each other. And it's super cute, right? Isn't that a cute idea? So these are very much, I'm, I actually hate this color. Like I kind of actually hate it, but doesn't it look cute with that? Like I would never pick this color to put in a quilt ever, ever. <laughs> but it looks so good, which is one of the great reasons to, if you're new to quilting or new to like whatever color work stuff, 
I don't know. Um, this is a kind of cool thing. Uh, it's a great idea to look for curated fat quarter bundles because these are folks who have fabric shops or mostly they're people who have fabric shops, even if it's just like an online only shop. Um, and they're pulling different fabrics from different lines that go well together that have like a fun cohesive story but maybe they would that would be a little overwhelming for you to pick unless you have a really good local quilt shop um so yeah so yay there's that so i have pieced it i have sandwiched it but i have not started quilting it yet and i'm kind of deciding on how i'm going to quilt it Originally, I thought I would do like a grid because I really love grid quilting. So just do horizontal and vertical lines. But some of my seams are pressed to open. And I don't like to do... Because lots of times when you do like a one inch grid, which is what this would probably be, or a one and a half inch grid, you're going to run over. Even if you try to offset it, it always ends up being, uh, it just ends up being on, some of them will be stitched in the ditch, like some of them will be stitched on that line. And so I'm sort of hesitant to do it because I don't like to do that on um, a seam that's been pressed open. We'll see. So I might end up doing the like triple zigzag stitch which is like the, it's like a very big zigzag, but instead of one thread at each point, you have like three stitches. So you don't have a really long thread. We'll see. Isn't that cute? I'm totally in love with it. Okay, I'm in crush with it. It's super large. That's all the quilting. Okay, and then in embroidery and stitching, I have some more eggs. Uh, I showed you last time. Burr, burr, burr. That I was stitching these little eggs and I have some more that I have not finished. So, but I have gotten them to the like ready to stitch and stuff stage. So I'll just briefly show you, but like how cute. So each little egg is four panels that you just whip stitch together. And I bought my fabric, my um, wool. I told you last time and now I can't remember. <gasps> right, isn't that color so good? That color is so good. Wow. Benzie. And she does this fun thing where you can, some of her felt colors, she sells the matching Guterman thread. And then I think all of them, she sells matching DMC embroidery floss. So the, to get a matching, ooh, I need to rinse that one off a little bit more. It's got a little bit of the, um, it's got a little bit of this fabric solving that it rinse out all the way. See, look. Little bit of like crusty stuff there. I was looking at the front of them, but I had stacked them all up when I put them in the bowl to wash them. So, like some of them, I think it's really just that one, has a little bit on the back side. Well, maybe I'll just use a little fabric. I like a little washcloth to get that off. But, like, look how fun this colors are together. Oh, so I'm sorry. So, she sells, uh, for a lot of them, she sells like the matching Guterman threads. Um, and that's what the pattern suggested, but I just used a, the DMCs because it was like much more affordable to get them coordinating DMCs and then just used a thread of those, like a single strand of them to whip stitch them together. And that worked out really well. Um, so yeah, because I thought I'm never going to use these color threads for like other sewing probably. So it just felt like it was like more economical and also just like a better like leftovers like I'm much more likely to use them as embroidery floss than as thread and then I have here I just have like my little project envelope and I have um so I have all of my little dmcs boo, boo, boo. and then I have some washed wool that I'm just using as stuffing 
Uh, but I'm also using like the leftovers from trimming down the eggs and some like other threads. But those are in a different package that I did not bring up here. Okay. So then let's talk about knitting. Uh, I have a little bit more done on my socks from Hey Brownberry. Look how good they look. <gasps> right. Oh. So this is another crafty girl in her sport weight. And I told you last time what color it is. And I um, inadvertently did not put the tag in there. Sorry. Uh, but Sarah's happily would work with you, I'm sure, to figure out what color this is. Sarah, sorry. Um, do, 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 Oh my gosh. Now and next. So these are now and next socks for Hey Brownberry. I am knitting mine with sport, as I think I said, uh, but I'm knitting them on double zeros and I'm knitting a 64 stitch size. Normally if I'm knitting stock or uh, fingering weight socks, I knit on double to triple zeros, depending on the yarn. And I do a 72 stitch, so. It's very enjoyable. It's just like a tiny little bit of texture. Um, but it's really fun to knit and it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming. Like, oh, I have to do that again. Um, which just gives it a little spicy spice. All right, I'll be right back. Double. Okay, and then the other thing I've been working on is a sweater that's sort of like inspired by the Istava sweater by Jonah Iyekla. Um, this sweater is written top down raglan and the gauge is also different. So basically I'm not using the pattern. I just wanted to acknowledge that that's was inspired, the inspiration. And I did use this, the texture, this, the stitch texture. So I've been working a little bit more on that and I have, it's mine is also going to be cropped. And I was trying to decide if I wanted to make it raglan or if I wanted to do like a, um, a drop shoulder. I think I actually will do the raglan. Um, so here's the body and then I have a sleeve. So it's just like a little chunky, fluffy hoot nanny and I have a little bit more of another sleeve. And I am knitting this with uh, Barocco's Mochi, which is 37% alpaca, 35% nylon, 26% merino, 2% other. I don't see that very often. 2% other. And, uh, <laughs> I'm holding it double. So I'm actually knitting this on US eights. Yeah. So it's like super fluffy. I got this on a deep discount from webs, which is yarn.com. And I, I love these uh, tube blown yarns. So it's just like a sort of like a, an I cord that's knit and then fiber is blown into the I cord or like the chainette structure. Uh, and they're super fun. They're very lightweight. This I think is a worsted weight yarn. I could be wrong, um, but you get 191 yards or 175 meters for 50 grams, which is like a lot of yardage um, for a bigger circumference yarn. Anyway, so it's probably gonna be quite warm, but I really just love how fluffy it looks has like such a great and it still feels very lightweight for such a thick sweater um one of the reasons I don't knit a lot of bulky sweaters for myself there's multiple reasons one of them is I'm often quite warm um but another is that uh for my size like it just takes more yarn so the sweater itself is heavier and like that makes it a little bit more unwieldy not just to wear and to launder and things like that but also it like wants to stretch out more it's a little bit harder to predict what it's gonna how it's gonna behave throughout its day um and especially like a yarn like this it's not 100 percent wool it's a little bit like how's that gonna work so it's nice to have 
um, a lighter weight option. Okay. And then something you haven't seen is I had this combination of yarns that I started a project last year that I was super excited about. It was this like super crazy crocheted sweater, which was, I mean, I say super crazy, but it was actually super crazy. Uh, it was like this like net almost, but it was like with three different yarns and it was so cool, but I started it and I could not make my gauges work out. Um, because of course I could not use the yarn that was suggested. Let's not be silly. <laughs> In my defense, it was like a lot of quite spendy yarn. Um, it was like on all the obby and on me and like multiple strands and multiple different kinds. It was just like, okay, that's out of my, that's out of my league. Okay. But because of that, I had this like great and fun combination of yarns that I had pulled from Stash. This was like when I had bought uh, in addition, I have no idea who made this, by the way. Sorry. Uh, I had this like finger, this lace weight volier from Knit Picks, which is this 30% silk, 40% linen, 30% baby alpaca. It's really fun yarn that I don't know. I had this um, one more round that felt like it wanted to be in there. I had maybe this um, Beaverslide Dry Goods in Vernal Glow, and then this hands bun, right? Like, doesn't that want to be a thing? But then it couldn't be the thing. <laughs> so I had like created this like fun collage of yarns that I was like really excited to work with, and then that just kind of like fell flat. So. I sat, I put it away, of course, and sat on it for quite some time. And I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I was like, I need to make a sweater vest with it. But then I was like, you know, I love the thought of that. Will I actually wear it? Maybe. Do I want to do it horizontal stripes? Do I want to try to knit it side to side? I couldn't find a pattern that really like gave me what I wanted. So I was like, okay, I'm not afraid to like go out on my own, but also maybe I don't have the headspace. Like again, going back and forth and back and forth. Well, finally I decided I went and had, <coughs> I went and had coffee um, a while back with Midtown Knitter. We were discussing the Gabor Mate um, book. something about normal. I'm sorry, I can't think. A anyway, um, and she was knitting on the Dre Renee Traveler shawl, I think. I forgot to ask her, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. So I thought, you know what? That looks so great in hand spun. It's big enough that I can probably work in most of these yarns in one way or the other. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. I cast on, and so this is the hand spun so far. Right? Hand spun. Why are you so gorgeous? Why do I forget to use you sometimes? So yeah, oh, it's so springy and fun, right? And like, this is not my best hand spun in terms of like quality, consistency, etc., etc. But boy, these colors. Oof. This thing that I had nothing to do with. Ooh, so good. <laughs> And I apologize. I actually skeined or bulk caked this yarn up even before I did that project, I think, thinking I would do something with it and it just did not come to be. So I, I apologize. I actually have no idea who this, who this maker is. I want to say that it was like Luna Moth or something, but I'm, I'm just making that up. I don't know. So I apologize to the dyer. Um, Ta-da. And then, okay, this, I haven't even started this, but I feel like I want to talk to you about it too. Speaking of things that need to be a thing. So I want to know what your favorite like gradient-ish project is because I bought these little mini skeins 
like 1,000 years ago. I looked it up. The dyer is no longer even dying. I bought them at um, like one of the very first Kentucky Sheep and Wools. Like the one that's in Lexington. It's in Lex it's outside Lexington. And like this is not my normal... I don't know what possessed me, especially then. At that time, this was definitely not my normal jam. I guess I could put them in order for you. But I've just been hanging on to them because they are super fun, right? And so then I was like, oh, I have this. This is from Spun Right Round. And like, look at this fun gradient thing that could happen. This is Hedgehog Fibers Skinnies. And then this is another crafty girl. And like, look how fun that is. Ah, oh, right? So this is another crafty girl in Lightning Strike. This is Hedgehog Fibers in Miranda. And I apologize, the spun right around the tag has fallen off, but I do know it's hers. <laughs> so I don't know. So what do I have? I have like 400-ish grams. I could possibly stretch it. I have like a like a neon lang yarn that's yellow. That I could probably put like I have 50 grams. So I could probably stretch it to 450 grams. What do you think? Fingering weight. So I think that needs to be a shawl too. I haven't knitted shawls in a while. I mean I have one that I've been knitting on forever, but I should have picked a more exciting pattern, apparently. <laughs> Sometimes you pick like the like, oh, I just need 1000 years of garter stitch. And then about year 375, you're like, ooh, that's more than my lifetime. That's probably not the best idea. So that's where I am on that one. We yeah. are. But every time I get out to work at it, I'm like, oh, this is quite lovely. It's also hand spun. So, you know, I tell you what, hand spun. I'm also getting inspired to try to spin some more. I've been trying to spin a little bit more. Um, kind of spinning just goes on and off with me lately. And lately, I mean like the last, oh, that's terrible. Um, like the last, <laughs> the last five years. <laughs> like that hand spun is ancient. Um, but yeah enjoyable to do but sometimes I just don't make time for it but I need to get back to it again uh, because I'm not making time for any better things certainly not okay but like let's go get some dinner let's go let's go eat outside because there's not as many mosquitoes yet yeah we could totally do it let's go get snacks and sit outside on the back porch okay there's not really a back porch there's a back concrete pad <laughs> we'll sit on the front porch it's better <laughs> um um, so in reading, what am I reading? Okay, so like I went through all of this, like reading the Gabor Mate and reading like all of these books that felt like they were so much of a mirror that I was like, I needed a break from looking at myself. Right. And then I do this where I just go look at myself for an hour again. Whatever. Um, <laughs> Um, so anyway, so I had this like deep, like I have got to get, I, I cannot think about my own self or like my place in this world or like potential trauma that I need to heal or like, I can't look for any more, uh, I can't look for any more psilocybin retreats. I gotta look for potatoes. Um, that kind of thing, you know, like how you do. <laughs> so... My solution to that is to um, go the complete opposite direction. And instead of like, in, in like insightful memoirs that are going to make me think about myself or like social commentaries or like deep books about like how we support trauma in the United States and the North American or like, and like how we need to work on that so much for our own health and for the health of our future generations. Like, what do we do? Let's just read a bunch of true crime <laughs> and histories of things. That's like a good antidote, right? So let me just discuss. That's all I've been reading. <laughs> so I am reading The Barn. 
oh my gosh, by the way, what is up with that book? It's so delicious. It's a book. Okay, let me just... Burr, 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 burr. The Barn, uh, The Lives, Landscape, and Lost Ways of an Old Yorkshire Farm by Sa Sally Coulthard. I told my husband I was reading a book about a barn and he was just like... <laughs> I was like, I know it sounds wrong, but like, again, so many histories of things like, again, the book of the book salt, um, fascinating. I love to look at history through things, uh, because it allows, again, it allows the author to tie in so many disparate topics that it's fascinating. Like the, again, the barn we're we're tying everything from like medieval, um, farming practices in England all the way through like Georgian architecture to like industrial revolution and the dietary habits of the city folk versus the country folk. We're tying in child labor. We're tying in uh, invention of commercial industrial uh, fertilizers. We're talking about the bone trade about like how England like figured out bone meal was like an, an uh, a soil amendment that could help with fertilization, like with uh, crop yield and things like that. And how like that spurred this like insane, like boom in bones and like they were importing bones from other countries. And the fact that like, there are all these like, that's not actually in this book that was in, um, oh, the book about the uh, shipwreck that's so popular as of recently, um, The Wager, A Tale of Shipwreck, Mutiny, and Murder by David Gran. I don't know why I never wondered, like, why all those, like, sh little uninhabited islands in the Pacific were, like, claimed. It's because they had guano on them. And guano was, like, this amazing fertilizer. I just kind of like abstractly was like, oh, you know, probably like just for like military strategy or whatever. It was for poop. They literally, and then there was like this whole other very dark side of it about how they got the poop and like how many enslaved people um, were like Pacific Islander enslaved people were used to harvest the guano. I had no idea. Like zero. Like, that would have been not on the list of ideas about why these like very small uninhabited islands were claimed by colonial superpowers. I didn't know. Also, if you're interested, the, the wager, fascinating. A tale of shipwreck, mutiny, murder. Scurvy, dude. Scurvy. Can you imagine can you imagine you're on a ship, you're months away from home, you're in a place you have no understanding of, you're trying to like go across the Cape uh, on, under South America. You don't have any idea what to expect. And then like everybody is dying. Like everybody on your ship is dying. And like they're dying in these like really crazy gruesome ways because like the thing about scurvy is it's so bizarre but like all of these like if you were shot 20 years ago like your scar tissue just dissolves i don't even understand but suddenly like old bones that have been broken years and years and years ago they re-break like I don't even know that that's really what you call it, re-breaking, because it's not like you have an injury and they break. They literally just like spontaneously dissolve the the scar tissue that mended them to get. It's not spontaneous. It's because you don't have any vitamin C. But like, can you imagine? I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine. Like, and like a lot of these people that were on the ship were literally just like kidnapped. They were just like go down, like, cause nobody wanted to go on these expeditions. Like people were like, no, I'm good. Thank you very much. 
And like the English would just like go down to the like into the poor neighborhoods and just like kidnap people and then like force them onto these ships to go on these months long journeys. And then like you're all dying. I don't even know. I cannot comprehend what that was. And like, I am not giving any excuse to any terrible thing that any of those people did. But also, like, we, what would we expect? Oh my gosh. Okay, I gotta stop thinking about it. I gotta stop thinking about it. But fascinating. <laughs> Scurvy, man. Scurvy is the worst. Especially if you have no idea why. Oh my gosh, what else? Oh my gosh. Abandoned Prayers, the incredible true story of murder, obsession, and Amish secrets by Greg Olson. This book is terrible. And I read every word of it. <laughs> this book. I don't know. I have now read three or four things by Greg Olson. I do not care for his writing. And yet I have read three or four things by Greg Olson. I don't know. True crime. Like the only thing I can think of. So this is the story of and a formerly Amish man who probably killed his Amish wife in a barn fire or like used a barn fire to somehow cover for it. Uh, stole essentially money by selling his Amish farm that like should have really stayed in the community, but like, cause maybe he only got married to get this farm. Uh, then went on like a strange voyage through America that you could only do in the eighties. Like, like, um, meeting men through advocate. Remember the advocate? Right. Flashbacks through the personals, like the gay personals and the advocate, like cross country and like just showing up in random places and like starting lives there and then like causing chaos, probably killing people and then moving on and then just like leaving your son places. And then unfortunately probably definitely killing your son. Like the most convoluted narrative, like this narrative, this, Okay, so the only thing I can think of, like I kept thinking, who is the editor of this book? Like again, I have written zero books. I've written zero books. But I kept being like, who is the editor of this book? Because I do not think they exist. But then it occurred to me, this is written in 1990 and it is like very extensively researched. Like clearly this person spent, a the author or somebody, spent a very long time like curating all of this research and so I'm sure part of it was just like and it has sort of like a very like old gumshoe reporter like just the facts ma'am kind of feeling like there is very little analysis like there are so many questions left unanswered and like yes there probably are no answers to the questions but like there's not even like postulated answers to the questions it's just like yeah like I don't even know that the questions are asked like I am asking the questions because I'm just like wait what and then I'm like, did he answer this in this book? Or did I just get confused because this narrative is insane? And like every small detail that this person, that the researchers found, or researcher, I don't know, this Greg Olson's, I don't know if he's like a, if it's just him or if he's like a cadre of people out there researching. But again, it was like very different to do research at that time. And so like maybe all of the research was just so hard won that it was like, well, no, I have to put this in because I spent like way too long and like driving to Idaho to find this information. Like maybe still read every single word of it. Also, I was sick. It was when I was sick. It was when I had the fever and stuff. I just laid in bed and my back was broken. Just lay in bed. That's crazy. Fuck. So <laughs> might've also been some residual fever. I'm not sure. 
But it was definitely just like, what's happening? It was bananas. It was terrible. It was tragic. But again, it's true crime. It's kind of a jam, right? But yeah, like this book, so what else? Oh, so then I was like, is this just because this book is old? Like, again, like part of me was like, again, was it just like a different time? But again, we don't, I don't know if because I'm not a connoisseur of crime, of true crime, like I've not read like mass market true crime throughout history or whatever. Um, so then I also read A Cold Dark Place by also Greg Olson, but that one is fiction. That one is terrible. Like it has, did I read it all? Yes, I did. Actually, I listened to it all. Uh, it's awful. It has like terrible character development, like ridiculous. And like the plot is not even super salacious and intriguing. Like it's also sort of convoluted, but it feels very similar to Abandoned Prayers, The Incredible Story of Murder, etc., etc. I don't know, man. It's just like a like, ah, he's a middle-aged white man in the 80s. Like he can just do whatever he wants. I don't know. Or again, is it just like a different time for true crime? I, I Maybe it's the same time for true crime, but that's not true because I also listened to, I mean, I've listened to other true crime that's more modern and it's definitely more cohesive. Um, I also listened to American Predator, the hunt for the most meticulous serial killer in of the 21st century by Maureen Callahan. That was cohesive. It was researched. It was detailed. It had unanswered questions. But it also posed those questions, I feel. Whatever. Did I still read Abandoned Prayers? I sure as shooting did. <laughs> I wish it were made up. Unfortunately, it was not. Um, the Myth of Normal. That's the cover. But I've also been listening to Maisie Dobbs, which is, um, which I found because I listened to The White Lady, which is a period mystery by Jacqueline Winspear. I really enjoyed this one, The White Lady. Um, Spycraft, Great War. They, I really enjoyed this one quite like that one I enjoyed quite a lot. Um, the Miss Maisie I am enjoying not quite as much, but I am excited. Oh, excuse me, the Maisie Dobbs, not Miss Maisie. The Maisie Dobbs series I am enjoying as well. Um, not quite as much though. I would say The White Lady is, if I was going to recommend one from her so far, of the four I've read, that's the favorite. But yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm reading. Ah, also bad cream, true crime. Okay, I'm just going to say it. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and the Birth of the FBI by David Gran. Fascinating story. Horrifying story. Uh, it's a movie by Martin Scorsese. I don't know when that happened. I've not seen it. Um, horrifying story. Horrifying piece of American history that is not at all surprising, but is also surprising. Um, about the Osage people of Oklahoma and like fascinating just in terms of like how they're um, like what they did differently in terms of like their reservation lands versus other tribal entities and then a discovery of oil on their land and like what terrible things um, that that led to for them, for them and their people. Um, but, but this book, <sighs> Some people complained because I was kind of curious, like if I was the only person who was like, what is up with this book? Um, because the material is really interesting. Um, and it feels like there's a lot of potential for it and a lot of potential for more stories out of it. But, but a lot of people complained that like, they didn't feel like the book, or they felt like the book was repetitive or, um, that it could have been a Wikipedia page. I didn't feel like that at all, actually. I felt like I wanted more. I wanted more information about all of the individual actors um, and all of the actors that were not a part of the book. Um, 
but another one that felt like it suffered from weird writing like in terms of like how the material is presented um some people complain that it was not as much about the formation of the fbi i didn't care about that part quite frankly i mean i cared about like what steps were taken to actually solve these murders because they because this what is it that's what it is and this like the crimes surrounding them um but yeah i definitely didn't i just felt like it was like i felt like there was so much more to the story that could have been told that was neglected but then there were also all these like weird details that like just sort of like randomly again it felt like i researched this so i'm putting it in i found out this information and like maybe it was really important to the author at one point or again like maybe it was a hard won victory to find that information but like didn't actually feel like it was a part of the narrative um so yeah i'm curious to see what the film is like the only the only people that complained about it that i read they complained about it being too long and they were like talking about how uh there was too much information about some of the women involved were men so i'm curious to know what their motivation was for thinking there was too much i was like there's not enough information about them i want to know more anyway but did i read every dang page of it yes i did because i was very interesting, but maybe somebody should rewrite this story. Just saying. Okay, I think that's enough. Oh gosh, I'm such a mess. Oh, but then I also finished, oh, I just didn't add it yet, because I was like, wait, there was another history of things. My friend Linda recommended, I keep touching the same thing. I'm so sorry. Uh, my friend Linda recommended, Hands of Time, A Watchmaker's History by Rebecca Struthers. Um, and that's another great one that's a good history of time. A good history of time. A good history of things. <laughs> uh, she, the author, is a watchmaker and I can't remember now what she is, but she's basically like a, she studies the history of time um as well as time pieces and so that one was really fun um the thing that stood out to me there were multiple things that i found interesting but the thing that has stood out to me the most in my brain is something that she made a very flip comment about um, and that is that the most used noun in the english language is time now, that is based on, okay, sorry, let me find my little bookie book because I did write it down. Because I was like, wait, what? That doesn't even, I was like, I gotta fact check that. It's true. Um, I also recommend books about birding if you're feeling stressed about life. Um, So this is the the noun thing. It's German by the Oxford English Corpus study of all words of published text from the internet. So this is, I would be so curious to know like what the most common word, and I said, did I say English language? But I, it is just the most common noun. Um, I am so, I'd be so curious to know what that would have been historically. Like if you look at, all books, all material published pre, let's say, 1920. What is the most common word used then? Most common now. I would love to know. But yeah, so that, I think that study was originally done in 2006. So I don't know if it has changed. There were definitely articles referencing it from like as late as 2017 that I saw. Um, but another thing that's interesting that's, that's spurned off of that is that the 100 most common words make up 50% of the words studied in this, like, of all the internets or whatever. And that the words were studied, they were, t like, it was literally just, like, all of the words on the internets. So, like, everything from books to blog articles to emails to social media posts. So when you think about that, it does make sense because, again, like, 
like a lot of our interpersonal communications are about like what we're doing when and like meeting and things like that. But it still feels like it blows my mind. And I would love to know what it is like spoken word versus, of course, who could know. But it's definitely not the most, the word I use the most. But it did make me really think like, ooh, like how obsessed are we with, like that's fa that's kind of fascinating, right? Like as a window to like what our motivations are and like what's going on with us or maybe just how we communicate in this specific way, the internets. I don't know. But other things, oh, decimal time. I've always wondered about decimal time, but I've never looked it up. Cause I've always been like, well, if there's metrics, why never don't, why did we not decide to make the, um, the, like the clock into a metric? Because it's such an annoying thing to have 60 seconds and 60 minutes, but also 12 hours. It doesn't make any sense. 24 hours. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I mean, 12 makes more sense than 24. At least it's, 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 it's 60 is divisible by 12, but not 24. Anyway, so that was interesting. Because apparently, this was something. So decimal time has been used throughout history, but one of the most recent uses of it was like post French Revolution. They tried to adopt decimal time as like a, a counter, but it only lasted a few years. But isn't that I thought that was super fun. And so then they, she also talks about like the clock as like the tool of like in, in the industrial age, like the clock as the tool to like manipulate people's time, like that foremen would be the only people who would have enough money to have a clock or to have access to the time. And so they would like set things back and set things forward to try to like make their workers work more time. And then it was like actually like illegal for the workers to have like illegal. I don't think that's the right word. But they were like confiscate people's time pieces because they were like anti-union or whatever. So interesting. And then there was this other thing that again was like this very slight, just like a couple of sentences but she talked about this study that was done and it talked about like what people's concept of time is like post industrial. Like, so as soon as people started working in like a timed way, so right, like used to like, it was a more natural rhythm in terms of like, it was like, well, what is the weather like today? How much sunlight do we have today? What like needs to be done today? Like just because like we're doing agriculture and different things happen in different cycles and things like that. But when it changed from that to more of a like standardized industrial work day, that was like the same day every day that there was a different, like there was a change or there was at least a study at that time that talked about people's concept of time became much more focused on the ending of certain periods of time. So the end of the work day, you would look forward to the end of the work day. You would look in forward to the end of the work week, but then you would also look forward in a negative way to the end of your week end. Um, and so like, so like this concept of like, wait, did we just start doing this like creepy, not being able to live in the moment when we started punching clocks? Did we not do that? to the same extent. I mean, I'm sure when you were like a medieval farmer and you were like plowing the field and you were hot and itchy and exhausted and hungry, you were looking forward to the end of your day, right? But maybe that it wasn't this like constant mechanical part of your sort of every day that you were looking forward to this specific time that was ahead of where you currently were. I don't know. How will we ever know? Time machines. Um, but anyway, so that was really interesting. But there's lots more information about just like the like the history of different time, like the history of time pieces in general, um, and like how wristwatches were used to be like this, like when they were first came about, were considered to be this like ultra feminine thing, um, and it was only through like the need of watches in trenches in World War II that like it became more socially acceptable for men to wear a wristwatch. And then 
um, history of like the radium girls who did um, who painted the dials or painted the the numbers or the whatever painted the dials of clocks with radium paint so that they would they would glow um, and that tragic period um, for those women and like uh, but it was, it was very interesting histories of things they're really good so fun I think the first history of things I ever read was the cod, uh, which is by the same dude who wrote salt who, um, and that was like so fascinating to read. Cause I was just like, wait, what? And I'd never read a history of a thing before. Uh, so Mark Kurlansky, did he like kind of come up with that concept? But it was definitely the first time I ever read one. And that's been what, 20 years ago or something, um, or close to it. Okay, but let's go get something to eat because I'm super hungry. And like, oh my gosh, it's time. We need to do things. Mostly snack. Okay, I'll stop talking now. Um, so yeah, there'll be a shop update April 1st. Oh, if you're still with me. Um, the Wool Festival at Greencastle, that's what it's called now. It used to be called the Fiber Event. Um, I will be going to that, and I think I'll go on Saturday this year. So if you're going to be out and about um, for the Wolf Festival at Greencastle, they do have their classes up if you're interested in taking a class. I don't think I'm taking a class this year. Um, and I think I will be there on Saturday. Hopefully the weather will be lovely. Uh, and if it is, we will gather out kind of like uh, where we do every year. You'll see us. I will say noon, and then I'll talk to you next time about it as well. Um... Enjoy the eclipse. Oh my gosh, it's like a week away. What? I am, we are in the totality band. So exciting. Um, but yeah. Okay, I'll stop talking. Let's go get some snacks. Okay, I'll talk to you next time. Bye.